Amen. If you would take your Bibles and turn with us to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 9 is where we will be this morning in our text as we, uh, again, we're going to focus on the Advent season. And uh, so we'll be doing a little bit differently uh, than our, our normal uh, series in the book of Luke, but we'll get back to that um, uh, as soon as um, first of the year comes around. So the, you wish Christmas would go by quicker, you'll get back to Luke quicker. Uh, Taylor wasn't the only one who didn't get enough sleep last night. It was that light. So. But anyway, Isaiah chapter number 9, beginning there, verse 1, we'll read down through verse 7. The Bible says here, but there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish in the former time he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time he has made glorious the way of the sea, and the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. And you have multiplied the nation, you have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff for his oppressor, his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the trampling warrior in the battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. And on the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you uh, again for this wonderful opportunity to be able to stand and to uh, proclaim your word to us this morning. We're thankful for those that are here. Uh, those that are watching at home online, God, we just ask that you would just minister to us, uh, Lord, that you would drive deep within us a conviction of this hope that we have uh, in you uh, because of your birth, uh, Lord, but also certainly because of your uh, death and resurrection and, and because of the second coming that we look forward to uh, that we've already read about this morning. God, we ask that your will be done for us in your son's precious and holy name we pray. Amen. One of my favorite things to do around this time of year is uh, is to aggravate Camille uh, by dropping her hints along the way of what I've gotten her for Christmas. And sometimes I'm dropping hints because I really hadn't gotten her anything yet, and I'm trying to make it seem like I'm on the ball and having things done. But she cannot stand surprises, and so the whole time I'm uh, you know making hints or or talking talking it up about how she's going to really. Uh, enjoy this present, and, and uh, it's really uh, uh, eating at her. She wants to know. Uh, and then we get to Christmas morning, and she goes to open that box, and it's a vacuum cleaner. <laughs> and what a great husband I am to make sure that my house is clean. She has the right tools. Uh, but the process of that, and it's not always a vacuum cleaner, okay? It's only a vacuum cleaner when she actually asks for a vacuum cleaner, <laughs> and then I'll, I'll uh, be glad to oblige with that. Uh, but the process of that, I enjoy building up the hope and the anticipation of what Christmas morning is going to be like. And that's essentially what Isaiah is doing here in Isaiah chapter number 9. Isaiah 6 is a familiar passage to us. We understand that uh, Isaiah has received the call of God to go and to uh, become one of his prophets, to become a proclaimer, uh, to be the mouthpiece of God to his chosen people Israel, to uh, kind of help them Get on and stay on the right track. In Isaiah chapter 7, uh, Isaiah tells Ahaz that there is a Messiah that is coming. There is a prophecy of the birth of Jesus there in Isaiah 7. In Isaiah chapter number 8, Isaiah prophesies of the uh, coming Assyrian in invasion. And as you study Isaiah's ministry, uh, all you really have to do is look at Isaiah 6. You understand uh, that Isaiah was not being sent somewhere to uh, to preach where everybody was just going to 
fled the altars and agreed with what Isaiah had to say. Uh, they weren't particularly excited about the prophecies that he would proclaim. And Isaiah 8 is no different than that. Uh, he tells them, look, there is coming a time where you are going to once again be invaded. Uh, you're going to lose your freedom. You're going to lose the things that you've enjoyed. Uh, but he tells them, look, if you would just trust in God, if you would have faith in him, uh, you're going to come to the other side of that. And that's what Isaiah 9 leads us to. As you read the first uh, five verses here, you see Isaiah promising uh, that there are some good days ahead for the nation of Israel. As you look at those promises, first one in verse 2, the people who walked in darkness have seen a bright light. In verse 3, uh, that you have multiplied the nations, you have increased their joy. Verse 4, uh, the yoke of his burden and the staff has been broken. Verse 5, every boot of the, uh, boot of the trampling warrior in battle to all has been rolled and will be burned in the fire. We're going to look at those more closely. All of those promises, though, are contingent upon what he says in verse number 6. For to us, a child is born. Uh, to us uh, a son is given and the government shall be upon his shoulders and they shall call his name wonderful counselor mighty God everlasting father prince of peace he goes on to describe his rule so Isaiah is saying look there are better days that are coming to you but those better days are contingent upon the birth of Messiah uh, that would come and live his life who would come and die in their place, who would come and resurrect and ascend into heaven again, that is the only way that these better days are truly ahead for the nation of Israel. And so Isaiah is building their anticipation, their hope that better days are coming because of the Messiah that he would prophesy about and others throughout the scriptures. And so our understanding this morning is that you and I have a similar hope that we can enjoy these blessings now because the fact that Christ was born in Bethlehem. That's why we celebrate this season. But that hope is not just contingent upon the fact that Christ did come, but it is also contingent on the fact that he is coming again. And so our hope is to uh, build, and there's no pun intended when I say my hope this morning, okay? Actually, there's a lot of pun intended in it. I have several times throughout my notes to see how many times we'll catch it today. But my hope this morning it is to show us how we can build our anticipation uh, for these promises, but also enjoy them now. So the first promise that he gives to them, the first promise of hope, is that they have the hope of living in the light. The hope of living in the light. Drawing your attention back to verse number two. He says, The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light, and those who dwelt in a land of deep, deep darkness on them has a light shone. Now, this is kind of an unusual metaphor for us. It's not one that, uh, that you would anticipate uh, in our modern vernacular, per se, to get up and start talking about uh, living in light and in darkness. But although it's unusual, it, it's not one that's foreign to us. Uh, it's commonly referred to, even in non-Christian circles, for light to be associated with good and for dark to be associated with evil or with bad. Uh, you've heard the statement that nothing good happens after uh, midnight, they may say. For me, I say nothing good happens after 9 o'clock because it's time for me to be in bed. Uh, so anything happening after that is not good. Um, you've heard the statement, uh, the coming over to the dark side. Okay, that's an analogy of darkness being associated with evil. And as you think about this moving from darkness into light, understand that he's not talking in a physical sense. Although the physical helps us understand it. Uh, if you've been in a situation where your, your power's been out for a long time, you understand uh, the uh, importance of light. You understand the, uh, the, the good thing that light brings. If you've been in a dark cave for a while, uh, you understand that although surprising at first when you come out of that, how much more beneficial it is 
to have light. So he's referring to this in a spiritual sense. And we understand that spiritually, the darkness is referring to the dominion or the kingdom of Satan. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12 would put it this way. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces in heavenly places. And so the kingdom of Satan is the kingdom of darkness. John 1 verse 4 and 5 says, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And so Jesus, in his own words, said that I am a part of the kingdom of light, bringing light into the world. So you'll stay with me. We're going somewhere. I promise you with this. You may say, well, Daniel, maybe you didn't get enough sleep last night. Uh, but I promise you, I got enough sleep. I got up like Fox told me to and my body said to. Uh, so I think we're good, okay? If you guys are good, I'm good. We are headed somewhere here. The promise of living in the light. What Jesus did when he came to this earth and born in a manger, celebrated on Christmas Day, and then through his life, through his death, and through his resurrection, allowed us to transfer our membership, our citizenship, from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. What difference does that make? Well, light exposes evil. It is God's good grace to us that he allows us to see the choices that we've made that have fallen short of God's expectation. But it also, it's also God's good grace that allows us to see that those choices are what, are what is causing the death in our lives. It is those choices that we're making that is causing the frustration that we might have experienced. Or, or the, the gap that we feel between us and God. And so when we're in the kingdom of light, we begin to see... Uh, things for what they are as being either good or bad as either appropriate or inappropriate as something God wants from us as, as opposed to something that God does not want from us so light exposes things light helps us to see God more clearly to see his righteousness to see his holiness to see what he desires for us in our lives and this promise this hope is that although we are living in a presently dark world, we have glimpses and glimmers of light that helps us see the difference. It also helps us to understand that, man, we're still living in a season of darkness. The death and disease are still rampant today, just like it was in Israel's day. That, that we still have to live with the results of the fall, that we still have to live with what in our minds seems like evil conquering life, where evil seems to reign rampant and goes unpunished. Can I remind you this morning that because Christ is coming back, that we have a hope that God is still going to win in the end? We have a hope that all of the evil we see in this world is going to be put to death permanently? We have a hope that we are going to one day live for eternity and not have to deal with death and disease. We have a hope that one day we're going to live in a permanent kingdom of light where there is no evil and there is no results of evil. That's the hope that Isaiah was building for them. But there's also the hope that they are living and can live a life of confidence. In verse number three, he says this, you have multiplied the nations. Now, who is that you? That you is God. So as Isaiah is writing, he's kind of uh, balancing between talking to them and talking to God. That you is God. You have multiplied the nations. A direct fulfillment of what God promised to the children of Israel through Abraham in the book of Genesis. That he would bless them. That he would create a great nation. And the descendants would be... Uh, far more than any of us could count or number. Isaiah chapter 9 tells us that in Christ, when he is born, remember all of this is pointing downward towards verse 6, verse six for unto us is born, that in Christ, that promise is going to be completely fulfilled. That God is going to create and form 
a group of people that hopefully we all are a part of this morning that will worship him for all of eternity. And that people will include people from every nation, every tribe, every tongue. And Isaiah's prophecy here is that God is surely going to fulfill that. That's why we're still here. It's because that promise is not yet completed, but it will be. But this is not just a reminder that we can live in confidence that God will fulfill that promise, but we can live in confidence that God will fulfill every promise he's made to us. Do you think there was any part of the nation of Israel this day that looked around at their present condition? Looked around at the coming Assyrian invasion invasion, and said, I just don't see how God's going to do that. Just me? Am I the only one that can understand how they would question that? How are we going to survive all of this? Man, we've been through this over and over and over again. Uh, we should just give up and become Assyrians ourselves and forget about all this Israel stuff because we keep finding ourselves back here. Can I ask you today, is there a part of your life that you read these promises of God, you listen to me pontificate about how good God is and all the blessings that God has promised to us, and I can say that that's going to happen. You say, brother, I just don't see how God can bring all of that to fruition. But yet you fast forward to the nation of Israel's history, for unto us a child is born. The Bible tells us in the beginning of the New Testament in those opening Gospels that God fulfilled that promise. And that through the blood of Christ, he is creating a nation from every nation, group, tongue. That includes us. We're not Israelites. We don't speak Hebrew. So we're a part of the promise of God being fulfilled. And if that can happen, don't you think the second coming of Christ can happen? Don't you think that's just as much of a reality as the first coming? Amen. Isaiah is building up their hope, their anticipation, in their confidence of the fulfilled promise of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we should be confident as well. So we've seen that he's allowing them to experience the hope of, uh, of having these promises fulfilled and uh, giving them the hope that we can live uh, in, in the light as opposed to living in the darkness. But he also encourages them to have the hope that they can live in freedom. If you look at verse number four with me. Isaiah says, For the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as in the day of Midian. Now, we were not too long ago in our Sunday school time in uh, the, the story of Midian uh, with Gideon uh, and the great conquering that God allowed him to experience with very little help uh, from Israel's side. And just place yourself just for a moment in, in Israel's day at this time. Isaiah, I mean, you just told us that Assyria is coming. Uh, that we're going to have to experience some bondage. We're going to have to give up our freedom for a little while. And man, I am so thankful that now you're saying, almost in the same exact breath, that that rod's going to be broken. So maybe we shouldn't fear Assyria so much because, hey, that, that's going to last a short period of time. We'll be on our way. Nothing to it. But then they would come to find out that Isaiah didn't have in mind as much in that time period as much as he was looking forward to Christ. He was helping them to see that their physical bondage was very similar to their spiritual bondage. It wasn't Assyria this time that was the enemy, but it was Satan, and it was their own flesh. That just like Assyria had come in or would come in and conquer them, that there's this thing called sin that comes in and conquers you and I, that grabs a hold of us like a bondage and we have all told ourselves that same old lie that I just can't say no to this. It just has too much power on me. We have all gone through that battle where we have 
had a desire to commit a sin, and there was that war within our flesh saying, no, I don't want to, no, I don't want to, and then all of a sudden we find ourselves giving in again. And what Isaiah is reminding them of is that through Christ, the bondage that they are experiencing is going to be broken. It was a hope that they didn't have to keep living on this roller coaster of worshiping God one day and worshiping Baal the next. Worshiping God one day and worshiping the golden calf the next day. That they could permanently live in freedom. Can I remind you, we have that same hope. The book of Romans, chapter number six, we were almost there in our Sunday school lesson this morning where Paul goes into a long discussion about now that we have been buried with Christ, that we have been buried in our sin and we can live in freedom, that we are no longer a slave to sin, but we are a slave to righteousness. I talked about that lie we told ourselves earlier. Well, that's a lie because God said it's a lie because we have the power as believers living inside of us, and it's not us, it's the Holy Spirit. So anytime we've, we're facing sin and we submit to God's Holy Spirit, and let him take control, that sin has no dominion over us because of the freedom that we have in Christ. Wouldn't it be great to live, uh, I started to say the next week, but how about just today? Wouldn't it be great to live today and not commit one single act of sin? Now we might get into debate whether or not that's possible or not. I don't have time for that. You might, but I don't. So I'm going to move on. Debate it in your mind if you'd like to. That voice you talk to yourself. I mean, I am talking about talking to yourself a lot, so uh, so you can do that. Wouldn't it be great to not only do that, but it would just be good to live this whole day without feeling guilty for something we did six years ago. To not feel shamed over choices we've made in our past. But God, I tell you, we have hope that that is a reality today because of what Christ has done for us. Because of what the Bible reminds us of, that when we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all of the unrighteousness. When he has promised not to remember our sins, not to bring them up to our charge again, where we can say no to sin, when we are living under the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit of God in our lives, that we can have that hope. I'm going to remind you of all of this at the end, so don't, don't feel like if you miss it now, you're going to miss everything. But can I remind you today that as a believer, there are still going to be times in your life where you still sin, and you listen to a sermon like this and say, man, Daniel, I really wish that was my experience. Daniel, I, I really wish that I could live guilt-free the way you're talking about. I really wish that I could live shame-free that I could live sin-free. Listen, I know that we're still living somewhat under the kingdom of darkness because of the present fall world we live in. But can I remind you today that there is a second coming of Christ where for all of eternity we'll never commit one act of sin as believers. Did you hear what I said? For all of eternity we'll never commit one act of sin. For all of eternity, you'll never even be tempted to do evil. That may mean your neighbor's not going to be there with you. I don't know. <laughs> Just trying to see if you're awake. <laughs> that for all of eternity, you'll never remember the sin you committed here in this life. You'll never live with the shame of choices you made. For all of eternity, you'll bask in the glory of Christ, the mercy of Christ. And for all of eternity, you'll worship him. That's the hope we have today. The final hope that he points out here kind of goes right along with our Sunday school lesson this morning. And so if you're like, I don't see the connection, that's because you weren't in Sunday school. So you need to join us in Sunday school. So we see here the hope of living in peace. Number one, hope of living in light. Number two, living with confidence. Number three, living with freedom. And finally, living in peace. I draw your attention to verse number five. Isaiah says to the people, for every boot of the tramping warrior in battle turmoil and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. Now, I think we can kind of understand why they would no longer need garments that were dropped, uh, dripped in blood. 
They're of no use anymore. Let's get rid of them. But ask yourself the question. Why would every boot of the triumphing warrior need to be burned in the fire? Don't they need those again? Not if there's no more war. They don't need the instruments of war if there is no war. If they are now at peace, they don't have to worry about a conquering army coming their way and they can rest in the comfort of knowing that they are safe and secure. They don't need those anymore, so we might as well burn them up and let's move on with life. Can you imagine for the nation of Israel as they begin to understand or, or try to understand for those that God would illuminate this to? The great sense of comfort that brought to them knowing that, man, we're not going to have to worry about fighting these endless wars anymore. We're not going to have to worry about finding ourselves conquered. We're not going to have to worry about losing our children or, or our fathers to uh, these wars that we're going through. All of that is going to be put to rest. Man, what great hope that would instill upon them. And again, ours is not physical in the sense that we can be war free here on this life but can I remind you that in the spiritual sense God has brought us into a place of peace with God Amen. That, that we can put down our weaponry because we have been conquered by God we are now under his domain and his control and so as believers we know that because of what Christ has done for us the battle has been finished our sin has been taken care of we don't have to worry about the fact that one day God's going to say, okay, all of that stuff on earth is done. Now, me and you, we really need to settle something that we didn't settle back then. No, it's already settled. The battle has already been fought. The victory is won. And so that allows us to have peace with God, knowing that it's never going to be brought back up again. We don't have to worry about being caught or found out because it's already been taken care of. We can live in peace with others. The Book of Romans would also encourage us that as much depends upon us to live peaceable with all men. And when I understand the great grace that God has bestowed upon me, man, it's a lot easier to bestow grace upon you when your sins fail in comparison to mine. We can live at peace with ourselves, knowing that it's not dependent upon us, it's all dependent upon Christ. Knowing that when our hope is in Christ, man, this life may be stormy around us. But we know that God has us and everything is okay. And we can rest in that relationship. We can be at peace when the world is in chaos. Now to draw all of this together, I'm going to go back to the illustration I used kind of in the beginning. And just ask you to think about a time where you were eagerly anticipating Christmas Day. That whatever it is, and I almost gave away somebody's Christmas present because I was going to say something that I know somebody's getting. I better not do that. And all of you are going to be wondering, is it me? Does he know what I'm going to get? <laughs> See how that works? <laughs> whatever it might be, you were hoping to get it, man. You just knew that you were going to get the best they had. You were going to be like all your friends. You were finally going to be the cool kid on the block. For those that grew up on city blocks. And then you get to Christmas Day and you unwrap it and it wasn't what you thought it was. Instead of the name brand shoes, you might have gotten the knockoff shoes. Instead of what you thought was in the box, it was something else. Or maybe you saw the box and thought that it wasn't what you wanted and then opened it up and it was actually what you wanted. You had that feeling in your mind of anticipation It is my firm conviction today that the people that are frustrated with the Christian life are frustrated because of what we're talking about this morning. They've been promised peace. They've been promised victory over sin. They've been promised freedom from shame and guilt. When they go home and it's just them by themselves, the feelings of shame and guilt keep popping up. Monday morning walking into work, that same old problem that has caused you to lose your temper for years is there to cause you to lose your temper once again. 
that old nagging sin that has been a part of your life for so long that you've asked for freedom from is still a temptation. It is still there. That relationship that has been broken that you've heard how God can repair is still broken. And as people have begun to open the box of the Christian life and all these promises that have been made alongside of it, and while you've experienced some of it, you haven't experienced all of it, there can grow a deep sense of not hope, not anticipation, but of great frustration. Can I remind you today that the story's not finished? For Israel, they were encouraged to look forward to the birth of Christ with hope because of what that birth would mean. But when Jesus came, they missed it. Why did they miss it? They missed it because they were looking for something different than what they had been told to look for. They were looking for an earthly kingdom, and Jesus didn't come to do that. He came to formulate a spiritual kingdom. And I'm convinced today that we're missing the point of what God wants to do in us because we've expected him to make life, life perfect for us now. But that's not what God has told us. God has told us clearly in his word that there is a second coming where God will once and for all put an end to the kingdom of darkness. Where God will once and for all wipe away all sadness. Where God will once and for all wipe away the effects of our sin. Where God will once and for all allow us to live in the kingdom of light. But that day's not here yet. That day has not come. And while we can experience these promises now and enjoy them now, it will not be our eternal experience until the second coming of Christ. In that final victory of God. Amen. So as Isaiah encourages them to look forward to the birth of Christ in hope. Can I encourage you to look back to the birth of Christ with hope? Knowing that all of these good promises Isaiah mentions that it can be a part of our experience now. But can I encourage you with greater anticipation to look forward to the second coming of Christ. When all of these things will be once and for all made an eternal reality for you, for me, and for all the believers in the earth as God will bring together that kingdom that he has promised to us. Let us not miss what God wants to do because we're looking for God to do what he has not promised us he's going to do. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me as I